This lesson is an introduction to functions. And our key goal in talking about functions is to really emphasize the concept of mathematical modeling. You probably have studied functions in an earlier math class, maybe um, algebra or pre-calculus, but we want to think of functions in a different way here, specifically to think of them as mathematical models. And a model is just, you know, a simplified representation of something real. So the idea of this whole course is to study phenomena in the real world, understand them with mathematical models, and functions are one of the most basic types. Now, one thing I really want to emphasize is that you might be used to thinking of a function as being a formula, like f of x equals x squared plus 17. Okay, that is an example of a function, but a function is not necessarily a formula. A function, really, most generally, um, is a rule. And it's a rule that takes some inputs, and we usually refer to these as independent variables. And for particular choices of inputs, it assigns a definite output, and that output is called the dependent variable. So if I were going to show you what this looks like uh, in graphical form, something like this. A function is the rule where you put the independent variables in, and you get a dependent variable out. So to make this concrete, we could consider a couple of examples. Um, one is the function that uh, determines body mass index. Now, body mass, body mass index, or BMI, is a somewhat a controversial measure um, that's used to determine whether people are obese or not. And the basic idea is that, you know, whether or not you're obese uh, depends on your height and your weight. So BMI is a function that takes height and weight as independent variables and gives this measure BMI out as the dependent variable. Uh, another example um, is a pollutant concentration in the atmosphere. So we might specify the latitude and the longitude of a particular location on Earth, and then the altitude, how far up into the air we go, and then we can ask um, at that point, what is the concentration of some particular pollutant? And the function is the rule that gives us the right answer for those inputs. All right, so there are many ways to represent functions, uh, and we're going to run through some, uh, some examples of these quickly. We can be talking about a table of data, a graph, or a picture, an equation, or a verbal description. And to start out with a table, this is very straightforward. We could say consider the temperature on a particular day in St. Paul, Minnesota, and our independent variable is going to be hours since midnight. That's the thing we're going to place as an input. And the output is simply what is the temperature at that time in degrees Fahrenheit. Input is time, output is temperature. And here's a table of data. This is one way of describing that function. Another way is to graph that data. So we take, again, the independent variable, hour since midnight, plot that on the horizontal axis, and we take the dependent variable, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, and we plot that on the vertical axis, and we get this set of points here. Okay, and this graph is another way of representing that function. We might even sometimes look at these and say, well, those kind of look like they lie along a straight line. So let's imagine a, a, some kind of curve or line going through those points. And that's another way of thinking about this as a function. And then, of course, we could try to write down a formula. So we could let t, the variable t, represent time and hour since midnight. That's the independent variable. And we could let y, the temperature, uh, we could let y represent the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, and that's the dependent variable. And the rule would then be y equals 35 minus t, okay? And sometimes to make it even more explicit, what is an independent variable and what's the dependent variable, instead of writing y equals 35 minus t, we might write y of t equals 35 minus t to emphasize that t is the input. It's the independent variable, and y depends on that. All right, and then, of course, we could describe our function in words, and there's a few different ways to do this. We could say, to find the temperature at t hours since midnight, just subtract t from 35. Or we could say, um, the temperature is 19 degrees Fahrenheit at 4 p.m. and drops at 1 degree per hour. And for that, we have to do, uh, you know, a little extra step of math to get from this verbal description here to this one up here. But words are a perfectly fine way to represent a function. Now, I want to quickly run through some basic aspects of functions. These are 
characteristics and terms that uh, it will be helpful to know for the rest of this course. And the first is that horizontal and vertical intercepts are where the function crosses the horizontal and vertical axis. Okay, so here's an example. This example is meant to um, represent the revenue made, revenue in dollars, um, from selling something, let's say some tickets, um, where P is the price per person in dollars of each ticket. And there's a formula that we've written down to represent the function. That formula is written down here, and it's plotted down here, and I just want to briefly help you understand the shape of this. If we charge zero dollars per person, we can't make any money, because no matter how many tickets you sell, at zero dollars a pop, you make zero dollars money. On the other hand, if you charge too much, say $75 a ticket, no one buys, um, no one's going to buy the tickets either because they're too expensive. So even though the tickets are worth a good amount, you don't sell any, so you still make no revenue. And of course the function does something else in between, and you can note that there happens to be one point at which the revenue uh, seems to be highest. But for now, let's focus on what intercepts mean. Okay, so the horizontal intercepts are where this function crosses the horizontal axis. And you can see there's two places. There's this point zero, zero, and this point 75 comma zero. Those are both horizontal intercepts. The meaning of the horizontal intercept is when the dependent variable, in this case revenue, equals zero. That's when the graph lies along the horizontal axis. So again, there's two points. If P equals zero or P equals 75, you make zero dollars revenue. So these are both horizontal intercepts. Okay. We can also ask about vertical intercepts. Vertical intercepts are where the function crosses the vertical axis. That's this point right here. So this point zero, zero is both a horizontal and a vertical intercept. But the vertical intercept has the meaning of representing the function when the independent variable is zero. So that's saying if the price per person is fixed at zero, how much revenue do we make there? And the answer is zero. So again, these are both horizontal intercepts. And this one here, this is also a vertical intercept. Okay, uh, another piece of useful terminology is for us to be able to say whether a function is increasing or decreasing. And this always means what the function does as the independent variable increases. And that's key. So you have to imagine always walking from left to right, increasing the independent variable and asking whether the function goes up or down. And what we see is there's sort of two halves of this. To the left here, the function is increasing, because as we increase p, r goes up, right? But over here, the function is decreasing, because as we increase p, r goes down. So over here, decreasing. Another useful piece of terminology is the average rate of change. And the average rate of change is just the slope of the line connecting two points on f. So we'll do a, a quick... Um, a quick demonstration here, a quick example with this revenue function. And I just chose two points on the graph. Here the price is 25 and the revenue is 37.50. Here the price is 65 and the revenue is 19.50. We can ask about the average rate of change as we change the price from 25 to 65. So we can imagine a line connecting these two points. We can ask about the slope of that line and it's the change in the R values, which is 19.50 minus 37.50 divided by the change in the p-values, which is 65 minus 25, okay? And if we work that out, that's negative $45 in revenue, $4 each dollar in price. So what does that mean? We start here at a price of 25, and on average, for every dollar we increase up until 65, we lose $45 in revenue. Now, the sort of tuned-in observer is saying, wait, that doesn't make any sense, because initially, if we start increasing the price, the revenue goes up at first, and then it turns around and comes down. And you're absolutely right, but the average rate of change just doesn't look at the details of what happens between the two points. It just draws a straight-line trend between those two points, calculates the slope along that line. So here, again, the average rate of change is negative $45 in revenue per each dollar in price, even though the shape of the function goes up and then down. Another piece of terminology is concavity. Concavity tells us if the function kind of curves up or curves down. So this example here, it kind of looks like a hilltop or maybe a bowl that's been placed upside down on the counter. And this is called concave down. 
Okay, we can also think of another function that looked like this, and this is called concave up. And I also find it's um, useful to sort of combine um, this idea of concavity with the idea of increasing and decreasing um, to get really clear on all the different cases that are possible. So I'm going to, you know, sort of imagine four different functions here. Okay, I'm just going to draw four different pictures, one that looks like that, one that looks like that, uh, one that looks like that, and one that looks like this. Okay, and let's try to say whether each one is increasing or decreasing and concave up or concave down. Here, as we go left to right, the function goes up, so it's increasing, um, but it looks kind of like part of an upside down bowl, so it's concave down. Here, this is decreasing, because the function goes down from left to right, and it looks like part of a bowl that's right side up, a, a bowl placed the usual way on the counter. So this is concave up. Here, this is increasing and concave up, and this is decreasing and concave down. Okay, finally, we can talk about the relative change, and the relative change between two points on a function is just the change in that function from its baseline value, whatever we choose to be the baseline, divided by the baseline value. So let's take this point here, and we're going to think of this as being our baseline, and we're going to ask what happens as we increase the price from 25 to 65. And so the relative change between those two points is defined as the change in R divided by the initial value of R. So the change in R is just 1950 minus 3750, and then the initial value was up here at 3750. So if we do 1950 minus 3750 over 3750, we get minus 0.48, or in terms of percentages, that's a 48% decrease, or the relative change in the function between this point and this point is minus 48%. Okay, so we've reached the end of this lesson. I want you to now ask yourself the following things. Um, ask if you can, explain what a function is, identify and explain independent and dependent variables, recognize functions in a variety of forms, find a function's intercepts and describe what they mean, identify regions where a function is increasing and decreasing, compute the average rate of change between two points on a function, determine where a function is concave up and down, and compute the relative change between two points on a function. All right, that's the end of this lesson. Thanks so much.